the casting director works with the director in helping select the actors for a film. And along the, the there's kind of a two-fold approach to casting. There's the creative side where you, you physically help select the actors. And then there's the business side where you then make the contract and the terms of engagement for the actor. So you're kind of working on both ends. You have to not only be creative, you have to be responsible <laughs> within a budget. Originally, Qui-Gon was to be an American. That was always very, very clearly delineated. Older, we were thinking probably in his 60s, physical, someone who had a lot of stamina and had a lot of bearing because he still was a very physical role. Uh, mentor, very, again, um, sage-like and, and a real um, teacher. And in casting, what you often do is create short lists where you, it's just stream of consciousness, you write down on a piece of paper who you think would be appropriate for different roles, and then you sit down with your director and kind of with producer and go through it and say yes, 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 no, 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 and, and it's this constant kind of revising, revising of lists until you kind of get into the more physical end of auditioning and interviewing and that. And Liam always appeared on those lists, but with the little note, well, if, if only he wasn't Irish, <laughs> if he only was American. Everyone kind of looked at each other and George said, well, yeah, Liam's, why not Liam? Well, maybe he doesn't have to be an American. There's no real why other than that's what initially I thought. and. From that point on, it, it was, you know, Liam was considered for the role. Uh, I've tried to cast uh, actors that aren't instantly recognizable. You know, it'll be like that. You know, that some people down, will be vaguely aware of yeah. Liam, but most 12-year-old boys won't. Right here. They'll never seen him before. First off, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story. It's the, it's the first story in the Star Wars cycle. Um, and it's a great adventure story. And that's what I saw first when I read it and saw the, the photographs and the descriptions of these extraordinary planets and worlds that my character and various other characters explore and find themselves involved with. Second or third reading, it was, uh, yeah, it was like, oh yeah, there is this element to it now. Of, of course, these these races of creatures and individuals and human puppets, they all depend on each other here. Our two great societies have always lived in peace. Ah. The Trade Federation has destroyed all that we have worked so hard to build. If we do not act quickly, all will be lost forever. I ask you to help us. George is making a very, very strong point through entertainment of uh, that, that Life needs each other, you know what I mean? It's like uh, a tree needs the ground it grows on, the ground then needs man to kind of look after it. And In fact, my character makes a, a statement to this, uh, this, this little boy who becomes my apprentice. The DeLoreans are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. Inside your cells, yes. And we are symbionts with them. Symbionts? life forms living together for mutual advantage. That we wouldn't live unless we had them, and yet if we saw them under a microscope, we'd see these kind of nasty little bug-like things, that your instant reaction would be to kill it, but that is life. I don't understand. With time and training, Annie, you will. You will. It's about a harmony, I guess, but told in a wonderful, um, entertaining, as I say, way. And full of action and full of a very, very interesting basic philosophy that we all need to be reminded of. I'm ambassador to the Supreme Chancellor. I'm taking these people to Coruscant. In the Phantom Menace, I play a character called Qui-Gon Jinn. He's a kind of a maverick Jedi who sometimes goes against the wishes and the dictate of the Jedi Council. And he has a, um, an apprentice with him called a Padawan, who is this young Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Ewan McGregor. Come on, move! Everybody on board! Come on! Move is a character actor, and he's a comedic character actor, and he had this wonderful kind of, of playfulness 
in quality about him, even though the the role of Obi Wan is very kind of you know straight and 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 strong and all that, but he still had this glint, a little little glimmer in his eye. And Ewan has that. I mean, Ewan just had this has this very playfulness. Besides being a terrific actor and being able to handle the physical elements of the role, and plus the 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 the, uh, the kind of the character, he luckily resembles Alec, and then he also just has that kind of intrinsic quality that Alec Guinness has. I'm quite got the grip for my lightsaber. Yeah. It's all the all the lines. Me and my mates used to watch it, and uh, we'd, we'd be able to do the whole thing, we'd take different parts. I like being Princess Leia the best. You do your hair? Well, I have not long enough at the time. I'd probably get away with it now. It was extraordinary to stand in front of the mirror with all my wardrobe on and stuff. Because I was Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, and it was quite a... A moment for a young man. Hello, okay, so That's my son, Jet. Hi, Jet. Hi, Jeannie. Hi. 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 How are you? All right. And your name? Ewan. 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 Who are you going to be in the movie? Are you uh, the you? young Obi Wan, I think. Yeah. I hope. You know what we're going to do? Yeah. We're going to buzz his hair just like yours. Are we ready? <laughs> are we ready? <laughs> are we sure that this isn't a terrible mistake? Are you scared to death? Oh no, I'm really looking forward to it. I love it. What if my dad this is the biggest one. This is the highest one. Okay. If he decides he wants it longer, then he can wear the wig. Okay. And play the part. <laughs> it's thick, you see, Scottish hair. It's really gorgeous and really thick and tight. Oh, okay. Thickest hair in the world. Highlanders. Like that it's nice that it stands up. Yeah. Thank but it shouldn't look like he has been to a barber shop at all. The most difficult part is to not go too far, just go strange enough. Yeah. That's the biggest trap people fall into in these kinds of movies, is they just they go too far. Yeah. How about that much? That's fine. Well, don't get any more though, can you? Is it just be, will it just be braided at the top part? I sort of think it's better if it's braided all the way down. In essence, it's a symbol of a learner. Mm -hmm. It's got to have, you know, when we wrap the bottom of it, if, if we do wrap it, we could wrap it actually in little colored threads. It's got to, there's got to be some significance in maybe that wrapping of how many years you've, where you are in the right, training sure. process. Yeah. Well, as a rough start, I think that's a good length. But right. I do think we should rehearse some sword fighting and stuff with and see what happens, see how, how far they, we don't want them to get in the way. Nice, huh? There's not a great deal of soul searching going on when you're playing, you know, this kind of character. It's, it's fighting and a kind of Jedi frown, which I wish I mastered that. Quite a lot of that. Eyebrows. George, I'm doing the Charlie Sheen shot, whether you like it or not. Okay. But you come up, you should sort of look off this way, yes. and then you turn around and you see all these ships landing behind you. Okay. Well, you're directing, after all. I mean. It is not the greatest platform to project the most extraordinary performance. You're there to do a job that's very specific. It's about creating a character that's instantly understandable and serves the story completely. Some of the lies are absolutely impossible to say. But uh, not too bad. I got off fairly lightly. I mean, Alec Guinness has got some cracking lines in this film. I don't know how he does them at all. Well, I did say to George, you can type this shit, but you can't say it. And, and and it's still it's still true. I mean, it, it, there's a bit of a trick to say it'll take a few minutes for the Navi computer to calculate the coordinates. This is you. That's me there. I recognize the, the yeah. hunched shoulders immediately. <laughs> he didn't want to sit down and talk about the characters for hours and end, if at all. In fact, I'm quite happy not to talk to you at all. Thanks, an actor. <laughs> That's a lot better. But we do like joke about with him about that because he's not very. He claims he's, he says he knows exactly what he wants, but he just has got no idea to ask that. So he just got no idea how to tell you what it is he wants, which makes for a lot of fun on set. Are you going to screen tomorrow? No, I got I go to New York tomorrow. Oh. I got to fly to New York and then show Natalie the script. Everything's set. 
but you know, it's a bold idea to have an actress commit to three movies without reading a single line of dialogue. So I thought we'd be better. She'd be a lot happier if she knew yeah. and save her. It was Natalie Portman. There was no one else. I remember saying that in the meeting. Natalie Portman. There isn't anyone that really encapsulates the description, at least at that point, of that character. And so, she, again, Natalie was always the benchmark. And I continued to see plenty of young actresses, and they were, you know, some were fabulous, but kept coming back to Natalie. And once it was established that Natalie was available and, and um, interested, it was just a very easy choice. There wasn't really a choice. There's so much more to think about just than, you know, how am I going to say my line? What am I thinking right now? You have to think, wait a minute, I have to hit this mark and I have to stay out of the way of this space behind me because that's supposed to be some character and, you know, the blue screen's over there and the spaceship's over there and you've got to make eye contact with that, you know, person over there who's not standing there. And it's, it's just a lot more difficult than an average film because there's a lot more to think about. <laughs> Cameron Finley. I'm seven years old. I'll be eight on August 30th. Hi, my name is Devin Michael and I'm nine years old. Hi, I'm Mike Ling and I'm eight and a half. Hi, my name is Jake Lloyd and I'm seven years old. Hi, my name is Justin Burfield and I'm nine. George wrote it knowing that it would be an incredible task to find the right child actor. He had every imaginable element built into this kid from mechanical ability to earnestness. His look was important, his intelligence. And usually children's roles aren't that complex. And in Anakin, you had to have it all. We tested literally thousands of kids. We went all over the world for three years doing tests, shooting tapes. <laughs> We looked in England and Ireland and Scotland and in North America and Canada and the States. And it was a process of just going to every single location and contacting the agents, contacting the schools, and kind of throwing out this big net, bringing in as many boys as I could. I think I actually interviewed about 3,000 Anakins. And from that 3,000, I narrowed it down to three boys. Scene 1A, take one. Scene 1A, take two. Scene 1A, take one. Anakin is a little boy who lives with his mother. Uh, Good morning. Hi. How are you doing? How are you? Hi. Hi. All right. This is Natalie, who is otherwise known as Padme. We were just discussing where we were in the scene. They had to be. Uh, kind of wise beyond their years, uh, and they had to have a, a good charisma, a good personal quality about them that uh, could carry this kind of a film. We decided to, to bring them all up to, to a test screen at the ranch with George directing. That's a huge thing for a little boy to think that he could be the next Anakin Skywalker. I mean, in their world, that's mammoth. This is Natalie. Hi. Hi. All right. So... Anakin is a little boy who lives with his mother on Tatooine. You all know where Tatooine is, yeah. the desert planet. And um, he works in this little shop that sells used spaceship parts. There's very few children who can actually act because acting is experience and, you know, kids have limited experience. And a little shop that sells used spaceship parts. Okay. All right, Michael. Mm -hmm. Your first time. You've never met each other, so this is the first okay. first time you've ever said anything to each other. Right. Let me know when it's good for you, David. All right, roll picture and sound. Speed. Okay. Action. Are you an angel? What? An angel. I've heard the deep space pilots talk about them. They live on the moons by eco, I think. They're the most beautiful creatures in the universe. Scene one, take one. And action. I'm a pilot, you know. And someday, I'm going to fly away from this place. You're a pilot? All my life. 
I'm a pilot, you know, and someday I'm going to fly away from this place. You're a pilot? All my life. I'm a pilot, you know. Someday I'm going to fly away from this place. You're a pilot? All my life. <laughs> You're just a little boy. I won't always be. I won't always be. I won't always be. Great. Perfect. We had Leia and Luke. And then from that, we had to draw who their parents could or would be. And so we're kind of going backwards. Natalie had to look like Carrie Fisher, and Anakin had to look like Mark Hamill. I was matching parents to children, and I was matching an ensemble cast. I think you have to be a bit of an um, investigator, and you, you have to enjoy the chase. Are you an angel? What? An angel. I've heard the deep space pilots talk about them. They live on the moons of Iago, I think. Scene one, take one. And action. Are you an angel? What? An angel. They're the most beautiful creatures in the universe. They're so good and kind. They make even the most hardened space spice pirates talk. cry. I've never heard of angels before. Scene one, take two. Are you an angel? What? An angel. I've never heard of angels before. You must be one. Maybe you just don't know it. Scene one, take three. You can see the difference between the two kids. Yeah. Yeah. One is going to move the production along a lot faster. Yeah. Right. And the other one, I'm going to have to just There's so many do a zillion takes and then cut the performance. But the performance sort of rises yeah. way above yeah. 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 the other one does. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. it's so unpredictable and it's kind of have to go. Yeah. unstudied. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Will I ever see you again? Okay. Thanks for bringing that up. I hope so. Would you choose? Yeah. Jake. Because <laughs> he seems more natural. I, mean, I like his body language. Mm -hmm. It's just not trained. And this one just hits the beats. Yeah, I was going to say, some people audition real well. He's getting kind of quick at this. And yes, he's he been is. practicing. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, You're wow. signed, buddy. Right. We're very proud of you, Jake. And very handwriting, proud. too. Very so, good, Jake. What's it been like? You've been telling all your friends you're leaving for Star Wars, huh? Um, the only thing I said was um, I'm going away for the summer to film Star Wars. And then all these hands raised up for questions. So what kind of questions did they ask you? Oh, so how come it takes two years to film? Because they didn't hear me two right years. that I'm only taking three, three and a half months. Did you tell them why it's going to take so long for it to come out? With the special effects yeah. and stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. It was going to take them because the, of the special effects. Do you know how much money they're going to spend to make this movie? Um, probably over $50,000. They're definitely, they're definitely going to spend $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> Camera, I think. Okay, we'll take it. Yay! Yay! There we go. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's just who's right for the role, and that was the only qualifier that I had to work within. One of the most important things in this particular character is that he is a wonderfully nice boy. Uh, and then there's this very intuitive kind of gut feel you get about that's the one. With Jake, I just got that feeling. I'm a pilot, you know, and someday I'm going to fly away from this place. I think the, the greatest difference in any other film is given the freedom to cast who was right for the role. And I think that is, unless you've have been, unless you've done casting before or you're familiar with it, you have no idea the freedom that that gives you. That you have no constraints, you don't have to worry about getting any names attached or what the studio will think or what your foreign distribution will think or your money people. It's purely what's right for the role.